Yeah, okay, let me start. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we start a, a special lecture uh, by CMSA in Harvard University and in connection with Tsinghua University. Uh, and uh, today we have a rather special uh, memorial lectures uh, for four great uh, geometers in 20th century, starting from Atia, Singa, Bord, and Hughesbrook. Uh, about 20 years ago, I had a big conference uh, for in honor of these four great geometers. I call them Gang of Four, and they are all very happy to have this name. And well, I still remember those activities, and they are very pleased. And now they all passed away. With Singer just passed away about a month ago, so um, I think he passed away uh, when he was age uh, 94. So. We all remember their great work, and we like to have some uh, uh, mathematicians and physicists talk about their great work because they have connected physics with math in an extremely important manner. So, uh, so, uh, uh, so we, this is the first talk uh, delivered by Ed Whitton. So I will turn to Comrade Martha, uh, who is going to chair this whole thing. Okay. okay Thank you, Yao. Uh, it's my great pleasure. To um, I actually I see an echo, I hear an echo. Um, okay, it's my great pleasure to introduce Edward Witten as the first speaker of the CMSA Memorial Conference for the founders of Index Theory, Atia, Bot, Hirzebrook, and Singer. Uh, Edward's impact on both mathematics and physics is too deep and too wide for me to even try to do justice here. So however, let me just say in connection with the topic at hand that one of his early works was in the context of realization of index theory through supersymmetric quantum mechanics, uh, which was just the beginning of his single-handedly revolutionizing the application of physics to mathematics and vice versa. And this work was followed by his introduction of topological field theories of different types that has led to many diverse applications. Uh, let me just stop here and let's listen to Edward's talk, whose title is Isidore Singer's Work on Analytic Torsion. Well, thank you very much, Kermron and Yale. So, Is Singer was a close friend and colleague of many of us. And after his death a few weeks ago, um, Yale invited me and several others to give lectures in his memory. And this has become part of this larger program in honor of our other colleagues, uh, Atia Bott and Herzebrook. I, when I thought about how to do this, I realized that uh, Isinger's work in mathematics and physics was so wide ranging that it would be extremely hard to give a single lecture that would do justice to it. And I decided I would primarily talk about one aspect of his contributions. Although I'll touch on other aspects of Singer's work when it comes up in the story. So what I'll be primarily talking about is his work with Daniel Ray on analytic torsion and this work consisted of two papers. Uh, the first one here on um, analytic torsion of an ordinary manifold, and the second one on analytic torsion for complex manifolds. So I'll also say something about the connection of the Racinger work with physics. In fact, that'll be roughly two thirds of the lecture. And here I'll explain a number of connections. First is simply the use of zeta functions for defining determinants as we'll discuss shortly. Then there's the connection of torsion and quantum field theory, which was actually pioneered by another colleague, Albert Schwartz, in this paper I've indicated. Then I'll talk about how torsion for complex manifolds uh, has applications in string theory. Then the interpretation by Atiyah and Singer of the connection of determinants and anomalies. Then I'll discuss torsions and the volumes of moduli spaces. And in the last part of the talk, I'm going to explain a generalization of parts of the story that started with this paper in 1992 by Turev and Vero and has many re repercussions in contemporary condensed matter physics. So as I said, I won't try to systematically explain Singer's work in mathematics or physics, which wouldn't fit well in a single lecture, but various other aspects of his work will play a role today. Among them, well, first of all, his sing single most famous contribution, the Atiyah-Singer index theorem. Second, the Atiyah-Pitotti-Singer eta invariant. 
And finally, as I've already mentioned, the topological interpretation of anomalies by Atiyah and Singer. So a second of the four mathematicians that Ya mentioned in the introduction, Atiyah will be also making a appearance at several points. Torsion was originally the combinatorial torsion introduced by Kurt Reidemeister in 1935. It was important at the time because it was the first invariant that could distinguish manifolds that are different topologically, but they're the same homotopically. For example, it could completely classify three-dimensional lens spaces. So you start with a manifold M that's described by a simplicial complex. For example, in two dimensions, you could have a triangulated two manifold like the one I've sort of sketched here. And we, in defining the torsion, we usually assume that the manifold may be endowed with a flat vector bundle E over M. Following Ray and Singer, I'll assume it's a unitary or orthogonal flat bundle. It's possible to modify the definitions to remove this assumption, but the analytic torsion is quickest to explain if we make this assumption. So Ray and Singer begin their paper by reviewing a standard definition of Reitermeister torsion, but then they explain a variant of the definition that motivated their work. And it's this variant that I'll explain now. So you have this simplicial complex. Kerman and Yao, can you see the cursor here? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. Yeah. So for each Q simplex, like the one simplex here that I'm highlighting, so if EQ is a Q simplex, we define capital EQ to be the space of covariantly constant sections of a flat bundle E over E sub Q. And then the chain group C or co-chain group CQ is the sum over little EQs of big EQ. And then you have a boundary operator delta from CQ to CQ minus one that restricts a covariantly constant section from any EQ to its boundary. So in the usual way, delta squared is zero, so you can define homology groups, which are the most basic invariants. But Reitermeister torsion captures information not contained in the homology groups, and it can be defined as follows. So CQ is a Hilbert space in a natural way because an element in CQ is just um, a space of sections of a, a flat bundle and this flat bundle is unitary. So a section has a norm or absolute value at any point. It's, since it's a constant section, it has a constant absolute value, which is just a number. So the space of these sections is a Hilbert space in a natural way. So you can define the adjoint of delta with respect to this Hilbert space structure. And then you can define what it, the analog of what in Hodge theory is Laplacian delta dagger, delta plus delta, delta dagger. It maps CQ to itself for each Q. So we let delta Q be the restriction of delta to CQ. So Reitermeister torsion is most simply explained if the homology or cohomology groups with values in E all vanish. That condition causes delta to have a trivial kernel. So in that case, the torsion is just defined as a number. In that situation, Ray and Singer showed that the original definition of the torsion tau v of the flat bundle E is equivalent to this one, that the logarithm of the torsion is a linear combination of the logarithms of these operators delta Q. Now, as I remarked earlier, this isn't quite the original definition of the torsion, but Ray and Singer show it's equivalent. Now, the key immediate statement about the torsion is that it doesn't depend on the triangulation used to compute it. So it's an invariance of M together with the flat bundle E. The main step in proving this is to show that if you take a triangle in the triangulation and subdivide it into a larger number of triangles, the torsion is unchanged. <clears throat> so I only gave the definition if the homology groups are zero, but Reinsinger extend the definition to the case that they're non-zero and this is important in some applications I'll explain later. So I'll just say briefly how you do that. You, well, the determinant would vanish if the homology groups are non-zero, the operators delta Q have a non-trivial kernel, their determinant vanishes. So they work with del, that prime of delta Q, 
the product of the non-zero eigenvalues. And they use the same formula with debt replaced by debt prime to define tau. But now the claim is that tau v is invariant if you interpret it correctly. You have to interpret it not as a number, but as a metric or measure on a certain line bundle, which in modern language would be called a determinant line bundle. So um, anyway, this is how they described the combinatorial torsion. Now, the idea of Ray and Singer was to make a similar construction in Ramanian geometry. I don't think that physicists were, uh, in 1971, when this first paper was published, the gap between physics and math was such that I'm pretty sure that there weren't really physicists aware of the torsion or in communication at all with Ray and Singer. But in hindsight, the way a physicist, what a physicist would say is that Ray and Singer took a kind of continuum limit of the right Meister torsion. Anyway, they made a similar construction in Ramanian geometry. Instead of picking a triangulation of M, they picked a Ramanian metric G on M. And then letting, then they consider differential forms on M valued in E and let D be the corresponding exterior derivative operator with its adjoint D dagger and the corresponding Laplacian and the restriction of the Laplacian to Q forms. So they observed that delta Q are sort of Ramanian analogs of the operators that I call delta Q with this other font in the combinatorial case. And then assuming for simplicity that E has no cohomology, one says that E is acyclic if the cohomology groups vanish, so that the operator delta Q has trivial kernel, they want to define a determinant of delta Q and then they define analytic torsion by imitating the formula for Reitermeister torsion. So their goal is to define what you should mean by the determinant of delta Q so that this formula will make sense and will define a topological invariant, which they hope will be equivalent to the Reitermeister torsion. Now, an immediate problem is what you mean by the determinant of a self adjoint elliptic operator like delta Q. It has real positive eigenvalues, well, non-negative, but we assume none are zero. So the real positive eigenvalues, but there are infinitely many of them. If you try to take the product of all the eigenvalues to define the determinant, you'll find that it's badly divergent. So you need to do something to make sense of what you mean by the determinant. So naively, the determinant is the product of eigenvalues, but in this case, that product is badly divergent. They had the very nice idea of interpreting this formulas via zeta functions and heat kernels. So um, although it's a problem to define the determinant of the operator delta Q, there's no trouble with the heat kernel or the trace of the heat kernel, the trace of each of the minus T times delta Q where T is a positive real number. Delta Q is non-negative, so T delta Q is positive. Each of the minus T delta Q is small when delta Q is large. The problem with the determinant was that delta Q had a lot of eigenvalues, which were almost all of which are very large. The eigenvalues of delta Q tend to infinity. So for most of the eigenvalues, the contribution, this operator is very small and the trace converges. So one can define the zeta function. Well, then the trace converges and then the integral also converges <coughs> uh, if, if S is as a sufficiently large real part. So for a sufficiently large real part, this is simply a convergent integral. But it was known at the time that it can be analytically continued beyond the region where it converges. The analytic continuation can be analyzed using general results about the small t behavior of the heat kernel. So the heat kernel has an asymptotic expansion in powers of t starting with the negative power and then in increasing powers of t. And the coefficient of each term uh, multiplies a local invariant such as the Ricci scalar or the Laplacian acting on the Ricci scalar and infinitely many more I haven't written, but with increasing powers of T. If in this integral, you insert a power of T, you'll get a pole. First of all, you can do the integral with large enough S. Secondly, when you do it, you'll get a, a pole at a position that depends only on this exponent. And the exponents are known 
So the zeta function has poles at known locations. If n is odd, which for most applications is the main case in the study of torsion, all the poles are at half integer values of s. So the zeta function is holomorphic at s equals zero. If n is even, you have to be a little more careful. There are poles at s equals zero, but they cancel out of the expression you need. So the formula for the zeta function shows that if the sum over eigenvalues was a finite sum, the determinant, which is the product of the eigenvalues, can be written in terms of the zeta function. So that's simply an elementary true formula for a finite dimensional operator, finite rank operator. They propose to use the same definition for the determinant of a differential operator, assuming that we're in the case that the zeta function is holomorphic at s equals zero. So this was their definition of the determinant. And then with this for the determinant, their formula for the log of the analytic torsion became this one. That was their definition of analytic torsion. And they proved that the analytic torsion is a topological invariant like the right Meister torsion. And they showed it has many properties in common with the right Meister torsion. For example, they're both trivial on an even dimensional oriented manifold. I put the word trivial in quotes because there's some fine print there. But uh, the torsion roughly is trivial on an even dimensional manifold. That's why for most applications it's mainly studied on manifolds of odd dimension. Um, I personally studied the torsion a lot on an even dimensional oriented manifold. So the fine print was important in my work, but we'll get to that later. A second fact is that in a product of two manifolds where one is simply connected, there's a simple formula for the torsion of the product in terms of the torsion of one factor. And it behaves the same way as Reitermeister torsion. And similarly, the two behave in the same way if you replace a manifold M by a finite cover M prime. So this summarized roughly how they proved that torsion and analytic torsion had the same properties. They conjectured they were equal and delivered, developed a number of tools that they anticipated would be part of a general proof. And I think in hindsight, though I didn't understand this very systematically, the tools they were developing there are part of the relationship of the torsion to quantum field theory, which we'll get back to shortly. So the Reisinger conjecture that the, their analytic torsion and the Reisinger torsion are equivalent was proved a few years later in these papers. <clears throat> now, before going on, I want to stress that their analysis is not restricted to the case that the cohomology is zero and the kernel is trivial. In general, when the kernel is non-trivial, also in the Ramanian case, they use dead prime instead of determinant. In terms of zeta functions, that means they define the zeta function using only the non-zero eigenvalues. And then they show that the analytic torsion is a topological invariant if you interpret it correctly, not as a number, but as a, a measure on the determinant line bundle. And that generalization was important in some developments that we'll get to later. So as I said already, in a physicist's language, Ray and Singer took the continuum limit of the combinatorial definition of torsion. And their proof of topological invariance of the analytic torsion was based on some elegant manipulations that were reinterpreted a few years later by Albert Schwartz. Uh, we'll be coming to that in a few minutes. In their second paper, Ray and Singer observed that the, what's called the D-bar operator on a Kähler manifold X has all the formal properties that used for the exterior derivative on a general Riemannian manifold. To generalize their formulation slightly, you can consider the D-bar operator, I wrote zero one forms, but this should be zero P forms, valued in a holomorphic vector bundle E over X. The case they consider is that E is the bundle of P zero forms for some P <coughs> tensored with a flat unitary vector bundle over X. <coughs> but later authors consider a more general E. Then they consider the corresponding Laplacian, del bar times its adjoint plus the same thing in the opposite order. The restriction delta Q of this to zero Q forms and the determinant, determinant of delta Q defined using zeta functions. And then formally, 
that imitates the definition of right and Weistry torsion and to find the whole torsion of a whole morphic vector bundle E by the same formula they used previously. So again, this is the definition if the sheaf cohomology vanishes, so the determinants are all non-zero. <clears throat> In that case, they show that the torsion depends only on the complex structures of the manifold and the bundle, not on the Kähler metric that was used in defining the adjoint and the Laplacian. More generally, they def you define the torsion using the same formula, but considering only the non-zero eigenvalues. So then, if in the case they consider where E is the bundle of P0 forms centered with a flat vector bundle, they show that the analytic torsion depends only on the Kähler class of X, not on the detailed Kähler metric. So for a general holomorphic vector bundle, there is a somewhat similar but more elaborate story. Now, they define the analytic torsion by imitating the combinatorial torsion or by imitating what they did in differential geometry. But in differential geometry, there was a pre-existing combinatorial torsion that they compared to. But for a complex manifold, there was no pre-existing anything. So they didn't have anything to compare to. But instead what they did was to calculate the analytic torsion in simple examples to see if it was something interesting. And it was. So they explored their definition by computing the analytic torsion of P0 forms on a Riemann surface X valued in a flat line bundle L over X. And they showed the result involves very interesting functions that in particular are important in number theory. For X of genus one, they computed explicitly and they expressed the result in terms of theta functions. For X, a hyperbolic surface of genus greater than one, they couldn't compute explicitly, but they related the result to the Selberg trace formula. Roughly the Selberg trace formula expresses in terms of a sum of a closed geodesics, the zeta function determinant of a slightly more general operator, the Laplacian plus a constant, or sorry, plus z times z plus one, where z is a constant. So uh, that's where the second Reisinger paper ended. They had defined the analytic torsion of a complex manifold. They showed it has some nice properties and that in simple cases, it was equivalent to other things that were independently known to be important. So this is what I'll say by way of summarizing the two papers. And in the rest of the talk, I'm going to explain the influence that their work had on physics. And I'll recall the, the rough table of contents. The first is the use of zeta functions to define determinants. Then the connection with quantum field theory, which got a big boost from the work of Schwartz. Then I'll discuss applications in string theory of the torsion of a complex manifold. Then we'll get to determinants and anomalies, torsion and the volumes of moduli spaces. And finally, a contemporary twist on the story that started with the work of Trev and Vero and is continuing in recent years. So the first aspect of the Reisinger work that influenced physics was just that their method of defining regularized determinants with zeta functions was useful. So physicists had known earlier from the work of Feynman and Schwinger that determinants of differential operators play an important role in the semi-classical approximation to quantum mechanics and quantum field theory. But the widely used methods of defining these determinants were ineffective or inefficient in curved space times and didn't, well, were difficult to use or didn't give simple and clear results. But Ray and Singer had been working on a curved manifold from the beginning and had used the zeta function method to define determinants because it was very efficient in that context. So within a few years, physicists studying quantum field theory in curved space times had learned that zeta functions are a useful way to define determinants. They're the, usually the quickest way to the best possible results. Uh, I didn't actually know the references. Uh, so Gary Gibbons helped me in understanding what they are. The uh, first published reference by physicists using zeta functions for determinants was by Dalker and Critchley in this paper. They cite earlier unpublished work by Candelis and Rain. What really popularized the subject for, for physicists was a paper by Hawking where Hawking thanks Singer for discussions. And that's this paper. 
all in zeta function regularization in curved space time. So here, I mean, Hawking was not studying this, the specific combination of determinants that goes into the torsion, but he was, for other reasons of quantum field theory or seemingly different reasons, interested in defining determinants of differential operators. And he simply adapted zeta function regularization because it was the most powerful method. Uh, okay, I'm not sure if you can see the bottom line, but the, or this was followed by work by Gibbons, Hawking and others. Yes, the bottom line was visible. Oh, okay, it's not visible on my screen. So the next development involving analytic torsion to physics that I want to mention started with a, a paper by Albert Schwartz in 1977. So let's write a formula for the analytic torsion rather than its logarithm. I wrote formulas for logarithms because in their paper, Ray and Singer always, or I think always wrote it that way, definitely almost always. <clears throat> but let's just exponentiate the formula and write a formula for the torsion. So the torsion is a product of determinants raised to different powers. And at first sight, they look like a funny set of powers. Such expressions in general terms are familiar in physics. As I said, Schwinger and Feynman had introduced determinants in physics, determinants of differential operators. The most famous case is that if you consider U1 gauge theory on a manifold, which you can think of as Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism, that you treat quantum mechanically on a manifold, then what's called the path interval, roughly the vacuum to vacuum amplitude, is a certain ratio of determinants. It's the same, in this case, it's actually the same delta zero and delta one that appear here except that the vector bundle E is trivial in that case. So it's a special case. And the torsion would have the higher Qs for U on gauge theory, we don't, we just have delta zero and delta one. So physically the denominator is the path integral of the gauge field in a widely used gauge. And the numerator is the path integral of the ghosts introduced in the earliest version by Feynman and then explained, well, then DeWitt and Fadeyev and Popov. So obviously this formula is somewhat similar to the formula for the torsion. Uh, we, have, we, we only have Q equals zero and one and we have different exponents, but you can ask if there's some theory somewhat similar to ordinary U on gauge theory that leads to the torsion. And what Schwartz showed is that there is in fact a theory that's different in an important way, but also similar to U on gauge theory that does lead to the torsion. Now, to avoid some technicalities, I'm going to explain Schwartz's idea in the case of three dimensions, which is the first case in which the torsion is an essentially new topological invariant. So, okay, at least, okay, historically, d equals three was important because the torsion was used to classify lens spaces in three dimensions, where other methods did not give a complete answer. And you can study the torsion in fewer dimensions, and in fact, I have in a number of my papers but a lot of things happen first in three dimensions. So let's consider that case. So I let E over M be a flat vector bundle with a flat connection R, and I write D sub R for the corresponding gauge covariant exterior derivative. And then <coughs> Schwartz introduces one forms A and B, valued in E and its dual bundle. And then he considers the quadratic action I hope, well, let me just explain what the action is to make sure it's clear. A is a one form, so its exterior derivative is a two form. You take the wedge product of that two form with B to make a three form. And this is a three form valued in E tensored with its dual, where A and B take values. And we use the pairing between a, E and E dual to get an ordinary three form, which I've indicated here. And then we integrate the three form on a manifold. And Okay, I've here in, in that explanation, I assume that M is an oriented manifold so that we can integrate a three form. Actually, even if M is unoriented or unorientable, if B is reinterpreted as a one form valued in the orientation bundle tensored with E dual, then this integral still makes sense. So Schwartz's action is not limited to orientable manifolds. Now, following what Feynman and Schwinger and others taught us, the path integral 
of a quantum field theory with this action is the integral over all A and B up to gauge transformation of the exponential of minus the action. And then further following the logic taught to us by Feynman, Fadeev Popov, DeWitt, and all the other physicists I've mentioned, uh, you can do this path integral in terms of a ratio of determinants. And then Schwartz's result for this case is that the path integral of this theory is the determinant prime of delta zero to the three halves over the determinant prime of delta one to the one half. Well, I'm using debt prime because uh, if there are non-trivial eigenvalues, we want to avoid them in the definition uh, because otherwise the determinant would vanish. So Sch Schwartz's answer for the path integral of this theory is almost the same as what we'd have in ordinary U1 gauge theory, except in U1 gauge theory, this three halves would be one. So I, I remarked that standard physical theory led to this formula. And so you could ask, is there some kind of physical theory that would lead to the torsion instead? Well, Schwartz introduced this theory, which isn't standard U1 gauge theory, although it's based on similar ideas. And it leads to a very similar formula, but with a different exponent. <clears throat> However, if you use Poincaré duality, you find that Schwartz's formula here is equivalent to the Reisinger definition of the torsion. In three dimensions, delta three and delta zero have the same spectrum, delta one and delta two have the same spectrum. So the, you have a pairwise equivalence of eigenvalues. So the Reisinger formula for the torsion reduces in three dimensions to this one, which is what had come from Schwartz's calculation. So the, what, it, what this computation shows is that the theory considered by Schwartz with this action has the property that its partition function is the analytic torsion of Ray and Singer. And so in particular, it's a topological invariant. Well, why did this happen? The point is that the action can be defined on any smooth manifold M with no additional structure. As I remarked uh, earlier, M doesn't even have to be oriented if B is interpreted correctly. So in particular, no Riemannian metric on M is required. Since M is merely a smooth manifold, formally, the path integral should be, should only depend on M as a smooth manifold. In other words, it should be a topological invariant. However, technically to quantize the theory in a way that leads to the formula involving determinants, you have to first pick a gauge and the gauge choice does require a choice of a Riemannian metric on M. Then the Reisinger torsion theorem that the torsion doesn't depend on the metric is a special case of saying that the partition function is independent of the gauge. So a physicist looking at the matter today would probably use the machinery of BRST quantization to find the identity that implies that the torsion does not depend on the metric. Ray and Singer weren't thinking in terms of quantum field theory and BRST quantization, but they found the necessary identity by hand. Uh, what Schwartz did was roughly similar to what I wrote in this sentence, although he doesn't use exactly that phrasing. Schwartz's work was not limited to three dimensions. In any dimension n, he considered a similar action where a is a p form valued in e for some p and b is an n minus p minus one form valued in the dual bundle. So at least one of a and b is a form of degree greater than one. So a generalization of the usual fadeyev papa of gauge fixing is required, and Schwartz provided this. Anticipating some aspects of the modern BV approach to quantization. <clears throat> he, uh, unfortunately, he presented it, his approach to quantization in a rather abstract way, which slowed physicists down in appreciating it. But he showed that for any p, the analytic torsion Sorry, he showed that for any p, the partition function of this theory is the analytic torsion T of E as defined by Ray and Singer. There's actually something that puzzles me even today. So you can define this theory for any p, 
And formally, it should be a topological invariant because it, only, it uses no structure on M except M as a smooth manifold. But it does depend on P. So it could have had a partition function that depends on P. And I don't feel even today that I understand why it doesn't. In other words, I don't really feel I understand why this theory has a partition function that doesn't depend on P. That followed from Schwartz's calculations. But to me, that's a rather technical explanation, which I would have wanted to understand better and feel I don't. So to summarize part of what I've said more briefly, Schwartz's explanation of the topological invariance of the analytic torsion was that the torsion comes by quantizing a theory that can be defined on any smooth manifold M with no additional structure. Now, that's a slightly formal statement. To turn it into a real argument, you need to analyze the quantization carefully enough to show that there's no possible anomaly. That step is actually not too difficult. And I think it's reasonable to view Schwartz's paper as the first paper on topological field theory from the physics perspective. Of course, there were precursors and the papers of Reitermeister and Vrain Singer were important precursors from the math perspective. I was aware of Schwartz's paper because Sidney Coleman pointed it out to me soon after it appeared. A decade later, I was trying to understand the Jones polynomial in quantum field theory, which was a problem recommended to me by another one of the pioneers of index theory, Michael Atiyah, in whom in his honor this conference is. And well, an abelian theory like Schwartz had considered wasn't going to work. So I, but I imitated what he had done on an oriented three manifold M with gauge group G and gauge field A, I considered a theory whose action is a multiple of the chern simons functional. Since this action isn't quadratic in A, the path integral is not a simple Gaussian and can't be expressed just in terms of determinants. It was possible though, ultimately, to relate it to the Jones polynomial and its generalizations. But let's discuss what happens if you make a semi-classical approximation to this theory, because then determinants do arise and, well, interesting invariants in differential geometry arise well, well, we'll see, we'll discuss the beginning of that story. So if you want to do a semi-classical approximation, we have a classical Lagrangian. What Lagrange introduced Lagrangians for was that the Euler Lagrange equations give the equations of motion, Newton's laws. So here we look at the Euler Lagrange equation for a critical point of the functional I. In this case, it just says that the curvature should vanish. So critical points correspond to flat connections, which are connections on flat vector bundles over our three manifold M. So let A0 be a, cla a classical solution that is a flat connection. And to start with, we're going to consider the same case that makes the torsion easier, the case that the cohomology is trivial, which in this three dimensions means two things. The holonomy should be irreducible. It commutes only with the center of the gauge group and the classical solution corresponding to A0 is non-degenerate. It has no moduli, even, even infinitesimal ones. So these assumptions are equivalent to saying that the flat bundle corresponding to E has no cohomology. So remember, that's the condition that makes the torsion a number rather than a more abstract invariant. So we're going to discuss it as a number, but then we'll see what the more abstract invariants defined by Ray and Singer mean in this context. So, well, following Feynman, we write A as a classical solution A0 plus a quantum fluctuation B. And for large K, Feynman taught us that the quantum fluctuation will be small and that we can do a Gaussian integral leading to determinants. So the path integral over B See, instead of integrating over A, it's equivalent to shift the integration variable and integrate over B. But in integrating over B, we can approximate the action as a quadratic function of B. So there's a constant term, which is the action at B equals zero. There's no linear term because A naught is a critical point or a classical solution. There's no first order variation of the action. There is a quadratic term, 
and semi-classically we ignore higher order terms. The first term is just the action of the classical solution A0. But since the action is proportional to K, it leads to a factor that's highly oscillatory if K is large. So it's highly oscillatory in its dependence on both K and also on A0 if there are different possible choices of A0, different critical points. Let's look at the part of the action that depends on the quantum fluctuation B. And let's compare it to the theory studied by Schwartz. So this is what Schwartz studied in the notation I used in writing it. And this is what we get from these in the semi-classical approximation of transcendence. There are a few cosmetic differences. Well, there's an initial extra factor of k over four pi in one of them, but you could absorb that in rescaling b by the square root of k over four pi. The background flat connection was called a zero in one case and r in the other, that's just cosmetic. The pairing between a flat bundle and its dual has been called the trace in the Trun Simons case, with the flat bundle being the adjoint bundle. These are just cosmetic differences. There's one important difference compared to the case considered by Schwartz. Schwartz had two different fields, A and B, but Chern Simon's field theory only has one field, which I've called B. So that is a real difference. And I'm going to explain how you have to modify Schwartz's calculation because of that difference. I'll change variables in Schwartz's calculation by replacing A plus or minus B by C plus or minus over two. And now we have the identity of high school algebra, C plus squared minus C minus squared is AB. And applying that identity to the action of the path integral, we find that the Schwartz path integral, which is this one, first of all, dA dB becomes dC plus dC minus. And secondly, the action AB has a C plus squared term and a C minus squared term. So the change of variables factors the Schwartz path integral into a product of a C plus path integral and a C minus path integral. And because of the minus sign in this expression, which propagates here, the two path integrals are complex conjugates of each other. Now the C plus path integral is the one we got in Chern Simon's theory, where um, C plus, where B has been renamed C plus, and there have been a few cosmetic changes. But basically, this is what we got from Chern Simon's theory, and this is its complex conjugate. So, oh, so I've written it here. In Chern Simon's theory, we have this, which up to the differences in, in notation and normalization is the same as this factor. And this one is its complex conjugate. So the conclusion is that what Schwartz had calculated is the absolute value squared of the one loop path integral of the Chern Simon's theory. Well, the AB path integral of Schwartz is the torsion as Schwartz had shown. So the Chern Simons path integral is the square root of the torsion times something of modulus one. Well, if you work at this more carefully, you learn that the factor of modulus one is related to another contribution of Singer. It can be expressed in terms of the eta invariant of a Tia Patodi and Singer. So the upshot is that in the one loop approximation, the contribution of an isolated classical solution to the path integral is essentially what I've written here. A constant, which is one over the number of elements of the center of G, and that enters when you're careful with the fadeyev popov gauge fixing. Then there's the square root of the torsion because we get the square root of the, um, of the Schwartz path integral. And then we get a phase factor, which is the exponential of the atiyah patodi singer eta invariant. And this is essentially the one loop contribution to the path integral. For careful discussion of this formula and comparison to exact calculations by other methods, you can look at this paper by Fried and Gumpf. Now, so far we've assumed that the flat connection A0 is isolated, meaning that up to a gauge transformation, it's no, it has no deformation that preserves the condition that the, of flatness. We also assumed that A0 was irreducible. The, co uh, the combined conditions, as I said already, say that the flat bundle 
is acyclic and has no cohomology. So the torsion is a number. But as I explained earlier, Bray and Singer defined the torsion without any such assumptions. In the context of Chern Simon's theory in three dimensions, this has a very nice interpretation. Let's keep the assumption that A0 is irreducible, but drop the assumption that it's isolated. Then A0 defines a point in a moduli space M of flat connections over the three manifold M, two different kinds of M here, the moduli space and the manifold. In the path integral, the general logic of quantum field theory tells you that you have to integrate over everything. And that means you have to integrate over this moduli space as well as over small quantum fluctuations in directions normal to the moduli space. Well, the small quantum fluctuations are what I call B and they give, they give this formula in the acyclic case. We'll discuss in a moment what they give when we drop the acyclic assumption. What's the measure that we're going to integrate over M in the one loop approximation? The answer is that in this situation, the logic of Ray and Singer showed that the square root of the torsion can be interpreted as a measure on M. In other words, Ray and Singer showed that the torsion is a measure on some line bundle, and therefore the square root of the torsion is a measure on some complex line. And the line bundle in which the square root of torsion is a measure is precisely the determinant of the tangent space to the moduli space at the point corresponding to A0. So their theorem in the case where you don't assume that the cohomology is trivial tells you that this formula, this formula makes sense to be integrated over M. I've written the formula in a way that assumes that the flat bundle is still irreducible, although not isolated. If you drop the irreducible assumption, then the Racinger theorem tells you that you have to generalize this formula by replacing one over the number of elements of the center by the volume of the stabilizer, of the volume of the automorphism group of the flat bundle. So the one loop approximation to Chern Simon's theory in this greater generality gives a formula that makes sense because of the more general version of the Racinger result about the torsion. Now, all this is the one loop approximation to the path integral. There are further corrections involving an asymptotic expansion in powers of one over K. And they involve differential, invariants of differential topology that are less familiar. <clears throat> Singer became very interested in this expansion. And with Scott Axelrod, he established its well-foundedness in a very elegant way for the case of an acyclic flat connection. So this is the reference to their paper. So well, explaining that paper would make an interesting story in its own right, but we don't really have time to go in that direction today. So I'll just say that Singer did a lot of interesting work on the further corrections in this asymptotic expansion. Now, I wanna go on and tell you about another situation in which it's useful to interpret the torsion as a measure. That happens in a theory in two dimensions that nowadays is usually called BF theory. It's even more similar than 3D Chern Simons theory to the theory originally considered by Schwartz. In two dimensions, I'll only explain BF theory in a two, well, you can generalize it, but my application is in two dimensions, so I'll state things in two dimensions. You consider a theory with a gauge group G and a connection A on a G bundle E over a two manifold sigma, and we define the curvature as usual. We also introduced a field B that's a section of the adjoint bundle tensored with the orientation bundle of sigma, which is trivial if, C is, or if sigma is oriented. And then the action is the integral of the trace of B times F. Now the path integral to use some physics jargon, which I guess is also used mathematically, localizes on the moduli space M of flat connections on E, as you can see by an elementary calculation. To see the localization, you do the path integral over B first. So I use the fact that the action is linear in B. So we're integrating um, 
the exponential of i times b times something. And as in a one-dimensional integral, in the distributional sense, that integral gives a delta function. In this case, delta of the curvature. So, so when we do the integral over a with the help of the delta function and also gauge fixing, you get a ratio of determinants. And this ratio of determinants precisely corresponds to the torsion T of A. And the result is that the partition function Z is the integral of the torsion over the moduli space M. Well, this makes sense because if you follow the logic of Ray and Singer, you learn that in two dimensions, the torsion is a measure on M. While in three dimensions, the square root of the torsion is a measure on M. Incidentally, in higher dimensions, you can run into cases that I actually do not understand really even today. Uh, in the acyclic case, shorts show that you get a sensible answer for every P in every dimension. But in general, I don't understand in P dimensions, the proper analog of these two statements. Uh, <clears throat> now, if sigma is orientable, the measure that comes from the torsion coincides with the measure on M that can be defined in a way that one might consider more elementary using its symplectic structure. The symplectic structure, by the way, that was, well, whose study was largely pioneered by Atiyah and Bach, two of the um, people who are being celebrated in this series of lectures. So equivalence of the, these two measures is the meaning of the statement that, quote, the torsion is trivial on, on an orientable manifold of even dimension, which is one of the common properties of combinatorial and analytic torsion analyzed by Ray and Singer. In the acyclic case, the torsion being trivial on an orientable manifold of even dimension means that it's equal to one. In the non-acyclic case, it means it's, as Ray and Singer explained, it's equivalent to something you could define in more elementary terms, which here means it's equivalent to the symplectic measure. For unorientable sigma, as far as I know, the measure that comes from the torsion is not equivalent to anything else or nothing more elementary. It's been studied in more detail in this paper more recently. Now, whether sigma is orientable or not, the integral over the moduli space of the torsion can be computed quite explicitly using properties of the torsion that go somewhat beyond what we have time for today. And that leads to very interesting formulas, which are rational numbers in the even dimensional case. Um, and, and that's predicted by the relation to the symplectic structure. But in the unorientable case, you instead get a rational number times a power of pi times the value of the zeta function at an odd positive integer, the Riemann zeta function at an odd positive integer. So you, you get an interest, interesting integral representation of the zeta function at odd integers. Now I'd like to say something about the influence in string theory of the d bar version of the Racinger analytic torsion, which I'll call the analytic torsion of a complex manifold. So first I'll explain how it's been used in physics if we take the question literally, and then I'll comment on what it helped inspire in other work of Atiyah and Singer. It's mainly in string theory that physicists run into the analytic torsion of a complex manifold if you take the question literally. Uh, basically in two ways. First, the world sheet of a string is a complex Riemann surface. And when you do string theory, string perturbation theory in the simplest string constructions, you run into products of determinants on the string world sheet, which are the same determinants that Ray and Singer had studied for their simple examples of analytic torsion. So you, well, basically you run into the examples that Ray and Singer had in their second paper when you're doing string perturbation theory. But there's a quite different uh, manifestation of analytic torsion in higher dimension. For higher dimension, I mean for complex manifolds of higher dimension when you consider compactifications of string theory. The most studied case is a Calabi-L threefold X. In particular, the one loop contributions for the B model with a calabi target space involve the analytic torsion. This is true both for closed strings and for open strings. For closed strings, Brzezowski et al. showed that the one loop B model with target X 
can be expressed in terms of the analytic torsion. In this case, you get the particular case of the analytic torsion that was actually considered by Ray and Singer, namely for bundle, the bundles of P0 forms for various P. You get a cousin of this if you consider open strings. If you consider the B model for open strings on X, you run into the analytic torsion for a rather large class of homomorphic vector bundles over X. The reason is that in the B model for open strings, you run into a homomorphic version of Chern Simons theory, which is a gauge theory of a connection on the smooth vector bundle E over X, in which only the zero one part of the connection is relevant. If you like the connection, you only have a partial connection, a D bar operator on the bundle rather than an exterior derivative on the bundle. And the action is the Chern Simon zero three form of the zero one part of the connection, which is defined this way using a homomorphic three zero form on X, which is part of the definition of the B model. So many of the things I, that I said in the definition discussion of ordinary Chern Simons theory have analogs here with the D bar version of analytic torsion playing the role that an ordinary Chern Simons theory is played by the ordinary analytic torsion. Actually, I think there's an, I think it would be better to say that the D bar version of analytic torsion plays the role that for ordinary Chern Simons is played by the combination I mentioned, the square root of the torsion times the exponential of the eta invariant. So um, the D bar analytic torsion corresponds to the actual combination we met in Chern Simons theory, the torsion and the eta invariant. So that's, if you take the question literally, where physicists have run into the analytic torsion of a complex manifold. But there's another important development that I believe was inspired in part by understanding the D bar analytic torsion. And this involves an aspect of the work of Atiyah and Singer that I want to talk about a little. But here I have to give you for background a little physics. First, I want to recall how the importance of the Atiyah-Singer index theorem first came to be appreciated by physicists. By about 1974, quantum chromodynamics, which is SU3 gauge theory with quarks, often abbreviated as QCD, had emerged for, as the theory of the nuclear force, also called the strong interactions. There was a problem. There was an almost perfect match between the symmetries of QCD and the experimentally observed symmetries of the nuclear force, but there was one troubling discrepancy that was identified among others by Murray Gelman and Steve Weinberg, two of the most famous physicists of the past century. QCD appeared to have an extra U1 symmetry that was not observed in nature. Then the Yang-Mills instanton was discovered by Balavin et al. And in 1976, Harad et Huft, inspired in part by work of Jakiv and Rebbe, discovered that in the field of the inst an instanton, the kernel of the Dirac operator, first of all, is non-trivial. And secondly, is not invariant under the troublesome U1 symmetry. It was soon explained by Albert Schwartz and incidentally, this was another paper that I learned about from Sidney Coleman, who seems to have specialized, among other things, in telling me about important Albert Schwartz papers I wouldn't have known. Anyway, it was soon explained by Albert Schwartz that what was happening was a manifestation of the Atiyah Singer index theorem. The properties of the Dirac operator that it hoped had used in solving the U1 problem were exactly what the index theorem predicted, which what the index theorem predicts is an asymmetry of the spectrum. Of an asymmetry of the kernel of the Dirac operator between the two different spin bundles, what physicists call positive and negative chirality. And precisely the asymmetry predicted by the index theorem was what led to the solution of the U1 problem in Tuft's work. Now, this development had a huge impact in physics, which is hard to exaggerate. In fact, in the available time, I barely see how I could summarize it. But the role of instantons, fermion zero modes, the index theorem and the solution of the U1 problem was an extremely important development in physics that had, had a huge, huge influence. Now, apart from its influence in physics, I tend to assume it's part of what got Singer and Atiyah, among others, interested in physics. But 
I really only met them in 1977 uh, when this had already happened. So uh, I'm extrapolating from events that occurred a little bit before I knew them. This work was done in 1976. By 1977, when I met them, they were already quite interested in physics. And I presume that this development involving an amazing application in physics of the index theorem was part of what got them interested. Not only was this an application of the index theorem, but in a way it was the basic application. What was index, okay. The simplest version of the index theorem is in even dimensions. So the first case would be in two dimensions. In two dimensions, the index theorem is a modern interpretation of a 19th century theorem, the riemann roch theorem. In four dimensions, the index theorem doesn't reduce to anything more classical. And the basic example of the index theorem is precisely this Dirac operator coupled to a non-abelian gauge field that had led to this electrifying development in physics. So it wasn't just that physicists were using um, the index theorem, but they were using a very fundamental example of the index theorem that was a very important prototype for the work of Atiyah and Singer, but which I'm sure they had assumed was so abstract that it was miles away from physics. So what I know better, because I was a physics graduate student at the time, I just barely learned enough to be able to appreciate what was happening. I'd say a year before I would have struggled to understand it, but when this happened, I was on top of things. So I experienced firsthand that this was an electrifying development for physics. I can imagine that it was electrifying for Singer and Atiyah when physicists were suddenly using their index theorem, but I don't have any firsthand knowledge of that. I only saw the after effects when they were interested in physics. Now physicists describe what was happening as an anomaly. An apparent symmetry of the theory was in fact not a valid symmetry because of subtleties introduced in regularizing it. This particular anomaly was called a triangle anomaly because if you calculate it from a Feynman diagram, you have to draw a triangle diagram where the triangle, the solid line in the triangle represents a fermion. In this particular application, it's, the fermion is a quark, but it could be a, something else like an electron. And what are outside are gauge fields. Now, the anomaly in the triangle diagram had been discovered earlier by Adler and independently by Jakiv and Bell. And they had made another extremely important application of this anomaly involving a quite different puzzle. But the physics involved was quite different from the physics involved in relating the triangle anomaly to this problem. So even though one problem had been solved and was related to the triangle anomaly, it came as a shock when this work was done. But, uh, well, the adler bell Jakiv work happened before I was in graduate school. I started three years later. So this I didn't experience firsthand, but they solved another important problem. There was a contradiction involving the lifetime of an important elementary particle, the neutral pi meson. The neutral pi meson was decaying much faster than it should according to theory. And it turned out that an anomaly in the triangle diagram leads to a rapid decay of the pi zero particle. So to do this, they had to calculate the triangle, find its funny properties and relate that to some other important physics. But they didn't need to know about instantons, the index theorem or the properties of the Dirac operator predicted by the index theorem. Well, there was yet another important manifestation in physics of the triangle anomaly. And I have to tell you about this because it will lead to the work of Atiyah and Singer. So an important discovery in modern physics, by now it's pretty old since it was discovered in the 1950s, is that the symmetry between left and right is not a true symmetry of nature. If you look at nature in a mirror for ordinary purposes, it looks the same. And that's because parity is a symmetry of the forces that are most important for ordinary matter, which are the nuclear force and electromagnetism. But if you're a physicist, you know about the weak interactions. It turns out that parity is not a symmetry of the weak interactions. Now, mathematically, one consequence is that when you formulate the standard model of particle physics in Euclidean signature, you have to use a Dirac operator D slash that is not self-adjoint. It's far from being self-adjoint. It maps sections of one vector bundle E to sections of another vector bundle F. Formally then, Euclidean path integral of the standard model 
involves a factor of the determinant of a highly non-self-adjoint operator. Well, does this determinant make sense? You certainly can't define it by zeta functions. So zeta functions are defined using eigenvalues, but an operator that maps one bundle to a different one doesn't have eigenvalues. Well, that in itself wasn't a problem because physicists studying determinants in these years didn't know about zeta function regularization. But uh, there were other things they also couldn't do. But they certainly weren't trying to use zeta functions to define determinants. They were actually just trying to use perturbation theory, which means that they were trying to define the determinant as a function of a connection where the connection is assumed to be small, close to a trivial connection. And through hard work, well, the hard work was really done by sorry, Adler, Bell, and Jakeev in studying the triangle. A reinterpretation of what Adler, Bell, and Jakeev had done by these authors showed that in general, the determinant is not well-defined. And they gave a necessary condition for it to be well-defined. So formally, in constructing perturbation theory, they were using standard physical ideas. But when one implemented these ideas, taking into account parity violation, they ran into the triangle anomaly. And they found that a certain condition on the quantum numbers of quarks and leptons had to be satisfied, or the fermion determinant and the whole theory would not make sense. If the fermion determinant doesn't make sense, the whole theory is garbage. It's not well defined. This criterion had important implications. For example, the top quark, another important elementary particle, was discovered before it was, sorry, was predicted before it was discovered because without it, the fermion determinant of the standard model could not be defined. But what was the mathematical interpretation of what physicists were doing in these computations? This question was elucidated by Atiyah Singer in 1984. The idea was the following. When the Dirac operator maps one vector bundle to a different one, its determinant might not make sense as a number, but it always makes sense as a section of a certain determinant line bundle. Moreover, this determinant line bundle carries a natural Hermitian metric, which can be defined by zeta functions, and it has a natural connection. And in their interpretation, what physicists were doing was constructing the natural connection on the determinant line bundle. Physicists were completely innocent of that interpretation. Physicists didn't know about determinant line bundles and they certainly didn't think they were constructing a connection on a determinant line bundle. Physicists were just trying to compute a determinant in perturbation theory. But anyway, Atiyah and Singer explained that the correct mathematical structure is a connection on the determinant line bundle and then from that point of view, if the, nat if the natural connection is flat with trivial global holonomy, then the determinant line bundle has a covariantly constant section and the determinant can be defined as a complex valued function, which is what physicists wanted in the standard model. So Atiyah and Singer interpreted the um, perturbative computation by physicists uh, as computations of the curvature of the natural connection on the determinant line bundle. And they showed that the curvature was related to their family's index theorem in two dimensions more for a two parameter family of Dirac operators. Um, this picture also tells you that you should worry about the global holonomy of this connection, which physicists had just started, well, not, the, not understanding this language, but in a different language, I had discovered a global anomaly a couple of years earlier, and the Tian Singer explained that the generalization of this is, involves a global holonomy on the determinant line bundle. So this interpretation of the triangle anomaly was very illuminating for physicists. It clarif clarified the meaning of a number of important computations by physicists. At first, it seemed a bit abstract to most physicists, including me, as it was a reinterpretation of computations we were doing, but in time, it proved to be important. I believe in advancing this interpretation, Atiyah and Singer in part were generalizing to differential geometry, some things that were more obvious in complex geometry. 
In complex geometry, the torsion was defined by Ray and Singer as being in modern language, a Hermitian metric on a determinate line bundle. In complex geometry, a Hermitian metric on a line bundle automatically determines a connection. Ray and Singer didn't specifically talk about this connection, but it's a consequence of, it's an immediate consequence of what they said. Now it's less obvious that the determinate line bundle has a natural connection in differential geometry, but the interpretation of Atiyah and Singer was that it does, and that that's what physicists were analyzing. Now, as I said earlier, the practical import for physicists of the analysis of anomalies is to learn which standard model-like theories, that is gauge theories with fermions, are consistent and so could potentially be applicable in describing nature. Now, I want to conclude by explaining a remarkable modern twist on the equivalence between analytic and combinatorial torsion. Let's accept Albert Schwartz's interpretation of the torsion as the partition function of a continuum topological field theory. Then the Ray-Singer conjecture means that this continuum topological field theory is equivalent to a theory, the combinatorial torsion, that can be defined on a space-time lattice. A space-time lattice is physicist name for a simplicial complex in mathematical language. So I was familiar with this interpretation 30 years ago when I was working on Chern Simons theory. I didn't technically understand exactly how to write a lattice version of the Schwartz action, but I realized the equivalence of analytic and combinatorial torsion suggested something like this was possible. But regardless, I wasn't tempted to go in that direction because I assumed it was special to abelian theories. In other words, I assumed that the existence of a combinatorial version depends upon the fact that this theory is free. Free means it's bilinear in A and B, or overall quadratic, so that the partition function can be written in terms of determinants. I assumed that for a non-quadratic theory, there wouldn't be a combinatorial version. But Tereyev and Vera made the amazing discovery that still seems remarkable nearly 30 years later, that this is not true. If G is a compact gauge group, then the level K churn simons action, churn simons theory with this action is not believed to have a combinatorial description. But suppose we consider two copies of this theory with equal and opposite levels. So the action is what I've written minus something similar. Um, something similar, but with the opposite sign. This might remind you of what I did for the quadratic Schwartz theory, where I introduced C plus and C minus. And the action was a function of C plus minus a similar function of C minus. This is similar, except that the two functions are not quadratic, they're cubic. Anyway, well, Trev and Vero studied what can be described by this combined theory and discovered as a description of this model as what a physicist would call a lattice model in which the partition function is written in terms of local data defined on simplices. And summing over this local data, you get the partition function as an explicit sum over locally defined data on the simplices. It's not the fact, the surprise is not the fact that you can write an explicit formula of some kind, but that you can do this with locally defined data. So even for this theory, you can write explicit formulas. Uh, that's part of the relation of the theory to the Jones polynomial and related things. But the formulas can't be expressed in local terms on a combinatorially defined, combinatorially defined three manifold. In other words, you can't take, there isn't a lattice version of this theory. The su surprise, and as I say, even 30 years after it was done, I still find it surprising, is that this theory uh, can be written as a lattice theory. In other words, it has, an, it has a version, a combinatorial version, analogous to the combinatorial torsion. Now, more recently, condensed matter physicists became interested in this phenomenon, and we now know that there are such lattice representations of many three-dimensional topological field theories. There's a large literature from which 
I extracted three of the many significant papers. The modern understanding is the following. A topological field theory has a lattice representation if and only if it admits a gap boundary. Let me explain this criterion in our examples. Here's the action of the Schwartz theory. Well, mathematically, one wants to describe boundary conditions abstractly. And in a moment, I'll quote, I'll cite a theorem, an abstract theorem, but I'll just describe boundary conditions naively classically, the ones you can see semi-classically. So if you set either A equals zero or B equals zero on the boundary and leave the other one free, then first of all, this action is then gauge invariant. For example, if A is zero, you don't allow gauge transformations of A, but you allow gauge transformations of B. This is invariant under gauge transformations of B. That's an acceptable boundary condition in this theory. And either of these are acceptable gap boundary conditions. So the assertion that any topological field theory with a gap boundary has a lattice representation means that this theory must have a combinatorial version, which is what was discovered by Reitemeister in 1935, or at least he discovered one version of it. Nowadays, we know a variety of formulations. Now here's the Chern-Simons theory, which is related to the Jones polynomial. It has no gauge invariant gap boundary condition. It has a gapless boundary condition with chiral currents. That's important in its physical applications and in the way it's solved. So the absence of gap boundary conditions is a recent theorem of Freed and Telemann. Uh, well, they proved it in more generality. Uh, it's conceivable that this special that for this special case, the theorem is older. The double churn simons theory with equal and opposite levels has a gap boundary condition A equals B. So it has the combinatorial description discovered by Troyev and Vero. You see, if you set A equals B and only allow gauge transformations that preserve that condition, then this is, well, mathematically, you'd call it a well-defined elliptic boundary condition. And physically, uh, it's gapped. There are no gapless degrees of freedom on the boundary. So this theory satisfies the general condition for when a topological field theory has a combinatorial version. And the combinatorial version is the one that was discovered by Vero and Turayev. So that gives uh, a contemporary generalization of the work of, well, of the combinatorial torsion and the vera Turayev theory. Uh, it, well, these authors discussed generalizations of those for a wider class of topological field theories. Now I want to conclude by giving a sketch of why a topological field theory has a gap boundary condition. Sorry, why if a topological field theory has a gap boundary condition, it also leads to a combinatorial description. I'll follow this paper, the third of the paper I cited, but I'll only give a hint at the argument. Consider a topological field theory in dimension D. Suppose we remove an open ball from a D manifold M. So M had no boundary, but now you cut out an open ball and now it has a boundary, which is a sphere. So there's nothing inside the sphere. Outside is the manifold M. Since the theory had a gap boundary, we place that boundary condition on the boundary. Now, what does that do to the partition function of the theory? In other words, cutting out an open ball and putting a gap boundary on the boundary, what does it do? Well, to find out, so the claim is what it does is it multiplies the partition function by a universal constant independent of M. So uh, what, the way you prove that is you, you draw a bigger sphere that surrounds this sphere and is inside the interior. And in topological field theory, anything inside this bigger sphere affects the partition function only through the way it affects a quantum state on this bigger sphere. But in a unitary topological field theory, the Hilbert space of the bigger sphere is one dimensional. So any two vectors are multiples of each other. And here we have two vectors. One where what was inside this bigger sphere is a, is, is a ball. And in the other, what's inside is a ball with a smaller ball removed and this gap boundary condition.
The fact that those two vectors are multiples of each other means cutting out the open ball from the manifold has multiplied the partition function by a universal constant that's characteristic of the theory and the same for all m. Now consider any triangulated D manifold, which I'll draw here for D equals two. I remove an open ball for every D simplex. So, well, topologically, these red splotches are open balls. I didn't draw them well. I wanted the open balls to be quite close to the boundary. Of course, what I wanted to capture was that the top, well, the, the co-dimension one simplices. So in each top dimensional simplex, each D simplex, we've removed an open ball. And now I want you to get the idea that each D minus co-dimension one simplex is now a thin strip with large holes on each side. As drawn, this strip isn't all that thin and this one isn't all that thin. But if I had drawn it a little bit better with the red splotches almost filling the triangles, what you'd see would be a slightly thickened version of the D minus one skeleton of the manifold. So we would have reduced from a D manifold to its D minus one skeleton. What you see on each D minus one simplex is a D minus one dimensional topological field theory obtained by compactifying on a normal interval, the original D dimensional theory. It has a finite set of vacua and each, well, we're beginning to describe local data on a triangulation. On each D minus one simplex, you could have any one of those local, of those vacua. So we have discrete data local, labeling the D minus one simplices. Then you have to study more carefully the situation in deep co-dimension two, where D minus one simplices meet at a vertex. I'm not going to explain exactly what new local data comes in there. I'll just say that if you continue this analysis, you get local data in co-dimension two, then in co-dimension three, and so on all the way down to the bottom. And this story is described in the paper of Bardwaj, Gaiotto, and Kapustin. So I think I'll stop there, hopefully having given you a taste of why it is that any topological field theory with a gap boundary also has a combinatorial version, generalizing the right of Meister torsion. So this con the conclusion is a remarkable generalization of the equivalence between analytic and combinatorial torsion discovered by Ray and Singer half a century ago, where a continuum topo a topological field theory that you would define in continuum language actually has a combinatorial version. This generalization is of considerable interest in contemporary physics, especially in condensed matter. Now to summarize, I re reviewed the two famous papers of Ryan Singer on analytic torsion. And then I talked about the influence of this work in physics in several areas, zeta functions and determinants, the relation to quantum field theory pioneered by Schwartz, torsion for complex manifolds as used in string theory, determinants and anomalies with the interpretation of anomalies by Tia and Singer, torsion and the volumes of moduli spaces. And finally, a contemporary twist on the story that started with Vera and Tureyev and has many modern repercussions. Thank you. Thanks for this beautiful talk, Ed. Um, so we have time for some questions. Uh, let me just, uh, there was a question already asked whether or not uh, these are going to be recorded. Yes, this has been recorded and has to be shared. Then another one asks, uh, are the PowerPoint slides available? Is that, would that be available, Ed? I'll be happy to make them available. Great, so that, that, uh, that Ryan can put on the website. Um, if, if anybody has questions, you can raise your hand uh, and then I'll try to uh, let you ask the question. We have one question already written on the chat. Can we calculate anomaly in IR CFT without Feynman diagram using the idea of bootstrap or some topological tools? Uh, I don't know, but that's the hard way to do it. Uh, well, what does bootstrap mean in general? It means you use general properties of a theory that you understand, whatever general properties you understand, and you try to deduce what the answer has to be. So, uh, well, at least in usual particle physics, where usual quantum field theory in four dimensions, you have gauge fields, maybe scalar fields, and fermions. 
there's a very good mathematical theory of the anomalies of the fermions. It, it's, well, the most general statement of, the, of it involves the Atiyah Patodi Singer Eta invariant coming in in a slightly different way from the way it did in its lecture. In the lecture. It's hard to improve on that. Um, maybe if you study so, something like six dimensional theories where the, which are not so well understood, you might use bootstrap methods. In general, to do bootstrap theory well, you have to know more elementary things well. And the anomalies are usually in the category of foundational things that you need to understand first. But I might be giving the wrong answer in the sense that there might be situations where you would calculate anomalies by bootstrap. Okay. Another question is uh, Short's interpretation of analytic torsion is in terms of a QFT where M is a space time manifold. Is there a target space interpretation? Uh, that's actually an excellent question. Well, sorry. Uh, sorry, the M is the target space. Okay. <laughs> I could give the question several interpretations. I'm not totally sure what the questioner meant, so uh, I might be misinterpreting it. But let me interpret the question as being, is there a second interpretation? like the relation between the world sheet and the target space in string theory. So think of Schwartz's theory on a three manifold. Think of the manifold as being space time. So Schwartz's theory then is the target space theory. And you could ask, is there a string theory or a world line theory? And actually you can think of Trent Simon's theory as part of the A model. So it's part of topological string theory. So, um, there is a string theory version that leads to Schwartz's theory as a space-time theory. I might be missing something else the question I had in mind. So maybe there's a follow-up question, but. Is there a follow-up question on that? Well, okay. it, well, let's go to other questions and if the questioner had a follow-up. Okay. Can... Yes, so uh, Senhu, please ask your question. <laughs> Yeah, so anomaly is the uh, obstruction for solving quantum mass equation in BV for formalism. It's quite yeah. different from index theory calculation. Could you comment on this? Um, uh, the qu well, I'm not sure. Um, so, Okay, the question is, um, so the anomaly is, the anomaly is an obstruction to quantization. So it can show up in different ways and different approaches to quantization. And the BV formalism, yeah, okay. I'm afraid in answering the bootstrap question, I answered in the framework of anomalies for fermions, which also has what had appeared in my lecture. Um, the BV formalism is a general approach to quantization. So since anomalies in general are an obstruction to quantization, in general, they'll show up in the BV formalism as an obstruction to solving the master equation and quantizing. Um, how effective that is as an approach is different in different theories. For example, Costello has shown that it's an extremely effective approach in some topological theories and related theories. Uh, I don't think I have anything really smart to say right now though about the relation. Uh, well, yeah, okay. Okay. I don't think it's a good answer to give. It's a good question, but I don't have much that I can think of right offhand. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, I don't see any questions or nothing in the chat. Uh, there is somebody who's asking in the chat. Uh, uh, is there a similar theory in algebraic geometry and are there some similar applications of algebraic geometry in string theory? Oh no, so then maybe. Uh, so, so yeah, yeah, yeah so, so I think the question was follow up by, uh, there was a follow up question. Um, yeah, so I guess that's it. I'm not sure what's referring to, but then yeah. 
uh, the question? I, I, I think the question is, is there an analog? Uh, okay. What Reitzinger defines for complex geometry, we have a complex manifold and he uses, they use D-bar operators. Can you define it for abstract algebraic geometry? So for example, you could generalize it over any field, not necessarily the complex numbers. Okay. If I interpret the question that way, which I think is probably what was meant, mm -hmm. uh, definitely a lot of things generalize. So there are determinate line bundles and the determinant makes sense as a section of a determinate line bundle. Uh, what's a little tricky, uh, and I'm not sure the right answer to give, is the metric on the determinant line bundle given by the torsion. Uh, it's been studied by algebraic geometers like Dillian, so there must be some kind of yes answer, but I don't think I know what to say right now. I might be forgetting something. Okay, uh, another question is, what is the role of, somebody asked, what was the role of Quillen? Uh, yes, qu right. I, I think, yeah, in a fuller explanation of what the TN singer did on anomalies, uh, I think that they were, Quillen's work, I think, provided part of the background to what a TN singer did. Quillen had defined, I believe Quillen had defined determinate line bundles. And a, a metric on them in differential geometry. And Etienne Singer defined the connection and compared it to what physicists were doing. I hope I have that right though. I reviewed Etienne Singer's paper in preparing for this lecture, but I didn't review Quillen's lecture paper. And I'm worried about how accurately I'm stating what part of the story Quillen had done. Okay, another question is that uh, you mentioned that the independence of Short's path integral from P was a bit mysterious. Is there any interpretation of this when that action appears in physics? I'm not sure. Uh, I have trouble. With, uh, I'm not sure what answer to give. Um, so theories somewhat like the Schwartz theory appear in physics, for example, because there are P forms for various P's in string theory and M theory. Uh, I don't know the right answer. I don't have a good answer to that question, I'm afraid. That's a good question, but. Okay. Yeah. There's another question. I think Nikita has a question. Please go ahead and ask your question. Let's we'll see if we can. Uh, yes. So Nikita, please go ahead, ask your question. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I, I thought we had some uh, progress uh, in, in that direction in the late 90s with loss of uh, Muran Chadashvili in, when we studied the uh, BC beta gamma systems in higher dimensions, which you get from uh, twisted supersymmetric, uh, supersymmetric theories, not necessarily gauge theories. Yes. So basically, when you study the BF theory or generalization of BF theory in higher dimensions and you introduce all those and those for goals for, for yeah. uh, and all, all secondary gauge symmetries. I think in the end the Lagrangian, which you get in gauge fixed form will be independent of P. The role well, of the, what you call fields and antifields might be different, but uh, the well, picture of the same. It's not, Schwartz did something somewhat along those lines, but he didn't have the BV formalism at the time. But, uh, but that's a restatement of what I feel I don't understand. You can compute and find that you get the same gauge fixed action regardless of P, but why that's true is what I feel I don't understand. That's one thing I don't understand, but I also want to mention the second thing I don't understand, which I mentioned in the lecture, but didn't have time to explain. I gave two examples. So Ray and Singer interpreted the torsion as a measure of something. And in two or three dimensions, that something was a moduli space where you want to integrate and so it, their formula enabled certain quantum field theories in two and three dimensions to make sense. But in, in the generality you're mentioning, if the ghost for ghost have zero modes, how in the world do you interpret that in terms of the quantum field theory? Or what do you do with those zero modes? I feel I don't understand it. Maybe it's known, but not by me. Okay, and maybe the last one, last question. Well, last question for the audience. Nikita's here, so give Nikita a chance to talk again. Sure, <laughs> I thought he had no Continue, Nikita is on, he can speak. Okay, so, so well, some, sometimes these zero modes uh, 
add attention directions to the modular spaces of uh, BPS field configurations. So, so basically all these uh, uh, P forms, which one gets as, uh, as goes for goes, they are components of a super multiplet. This is of course bounded by dimension. This is not, this will not work in, in any space time dimension. This is bound in dimensions where there is supersymmetry. Okay. Uh, but then it will be just usual, well, by now usual, story of integrating over the module space of instantons or uh, you know <laughs> the, the high dimensional analogs of those so basically you're saying that there are other cases that have a nice interpretation like the two cases i mentioned but in generality we might not have that interpretation right in dimensions beyond 10 uh, beyond 11 probably not <laughs> as, as physicists we might only need cases uh, Somebody asked what happens for higher P in cases met. We don't meet completely abstract cases in physics, at least not yet. So right. maybe the only new cases where the erasing of formula uh, can be interpreted in a way. That can... For example, interpretations of uh, topological string theory, space time interpretations of topological uh, string theory, like in, you know, for example, now work with Kumran and, and others. When we uh, use the Donson Thomas theory as, as kind of non perturbative way of summing up ground Witten theory, we encounter similar integrals over the modular space of supersymmetric configurations in six dimensions. Yes. And recently I, I, I had this in, in eight dimensions. So, so these seem to be very nice uh, high dimensional analogs of those integrals. Uh, and you were integrating ordinary torsion or analytic or complex? This was torsion for an ordinary manifold or complex torsion? Uh, Debar torsion? It, it, it's it's it seems to be a D bar torsion because that's the these equation okay. the equations involve complex structure. Okay. Thanks. Well, it sounds like these would this would be what if in a very nice extension of what I explained. Okay, so thank you. And uh, one last question, uh, since we have run out of time, what is the relation between math and physics? How to study them, and we should study them at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> it's very hard. It's impossible to give universal advice in that question because the best direction is different for different people. So, uh, uh, to give sensible advice, I'd need to know the question. If you're young, learn as much as you can. That's the only safe advice I can give you. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, on that note, let's thank Edward again for a beautiful talk. And uh, You'll we'll have the talk uh, recording on the website as well as uh, the PowerPoint slides that Edward would kindly forward to us. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Thank you for the invitation. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, that was a really nice talk. Thank you. Great to listen to you. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, bye. Bye.